You're in the water loop. <laughs> Okay, so this faucet I'm turning on, this is the faucet connected to the rainwater tanks. And this is gravity that is bringing the flow to the end of the hose. Now how much water is in the tank? Well, I lift this up until it stops flowing. So you can see our tanks are about half full or half empty, however you want to call it, look at it. And then as I drop the hose, um, the water flow starts again. And we have this faucet right in the middle of the garden. So this water source is the most convenient and joyous to use. So that's the water source we use, not imported extracted municipal water. So we collect the roof runoff into the gutter, which then goes to the um, downspout pipe, which is directed via gravity right into the rainwater tank. We're in a different part of your property here mm -hmm. where you have planted the rain and have a lot of uh, different vegetation that provides even food. Um, how, does, how does the water work here? Yeah, well, um, so here we have perennial plants rather than the annuals that you have with your vegetable garden. And uh, similarly to the vegetable garden, we plant the rain first by creating these sunken rain gardens. So we capture direct rainfall and run off from the raised adjoining pathway. But what's different here is we're not just capturing rainwater and path runoff. We're also capturing gray water. So that lightly used household water from our sink, showers, bathtub, and washing machine, okay? So we've got some purple pipes that we've um, painted purple to identify them as the gray water pipe. So uh, in times of no rain, uh, we have a supplemental water source. We're not tank dependent here. It's all passive. Nobody has to turn on or off uh, a valve. So the, um, the citrus tree, that's not a native tree to here. It's not adapted to our long dry season and drought. So uh, we need to give it gray water in the times of no rain for it to thrive, mm. okay? But we plant that gray water in the same rain garden. So the rain garden is also a gray water garden. Wow. So it's all, these gardens are always getting the rain that falls, and they're also always getting whatever gray water is coming out of those, those sources. Yeah, they get a right. pulse every time we wash the dishes in the sink or wash our hands in the sink or take a shower. So the overflow comes out. We keep it high behind the fence there, and then we outlet it right here to the highest basin in the landscape. Fills this whole basin under the tub and then spills over into the basin to the white sapote tree. So once this basin fills up, it overflows here. There's a low spot between those two rocks over the path and fills this whole basin to freely irrigate the citrus tree, the chiltipine growing within it, and the other understory plants, which are also supplementarily irrigated with the gray water coming out of the purple pipe. Brad, I'm really excited about this part of the tour, how you are capturing rain from the roof and using it for your water sources. What's going on here? Yeah, so after proving the concept of how we can plant the rain to make that the primary or sole water source of the landscape, what about ourselves? What about for drinking, cooking, bathing, washing, so forth? So that's when we upped the game. So off of this uh, small structure, 400 square foot roof, um, I'm capturing 95% of my domestic water. So uh, two uh, 1,000 gallon rainwater tanks, we move the water from the roof via the gutter into the tanks with gravity, so there's no pumps. We reduce the cost that way. And then uh, the water comes to the faucet via gravity, and I can filter that for drinking and cooking purposes by putting that water into an activated carbon filter. It's a little Berkey filter. So I put the water in the top, drains down to the bottom of the filter, and there's a little faucet at the bottom of the filter at which I can access that filtered water. So grab a little right now, and there we go. So good. The good sweet stuff. rainwater. Yeah. So rainwater is actually known around the world as sweet water because it never comes into contact with the soil and its minerals, its salts, so it has a sweeter flavor. Um, also doesn't pick up the contaminants in an urban setting. Of course. So then uh, once that, uh, the tanks full are full in a storm, the overflow we directed to the high part of the property. Hmm. So it's 
taking advantage of that gravity, and then it fills a basin under the bathtub, which then fills the basin under the white sapote fruit tree, which overflows and fills the basin under the citrus tree, which then overflows to another. So we're stepping and sinking that water flow from top to bottom. So you, have, you get 95% of your water from the rain, what you need for, to use. Yeah. And still there's water going from that when the tanks are full to the landscape and to these other other uses. Yeah, That's and great. not just to the landscape and those plants, there's still surplus that those plants don't uptake. Mm. And that infiltrates to help directly recharge the community aquifer, while we're at the same time helping indirectly recharge the aquifer by not taking water from it, but instead relying primarily on rainwater. Wow. Incredible, incredible. And then that rainwater is used once again. So we looked at the gray water pipes um, elsewhere in the landscape. So when water goes down the drain, it hits the black pipe, which we direct along the fence line on two sides of the property. And we have multiple outlets watering all the plants along that. So we don't have to move a hose or anything. Gravity just moves and the pipes distribute the water where we want it. Incredible. Brad, I'm excited to come out here in the street in your neighborhood neighborhood and see how you and others have kind of transformed uh, the area to really plant the rain, to capture this rainwater. Uh, tell me what's going on here. Yeah, well, what we wanted to do is reclaim what had once been barren, exposed solar oven-like <laughs> uh, public rights-of-way, where you didn't want, want to talk to the neighbor because you didn't want to be out there. Right. You know? So it was too hot and uncomfortable. So we took a before photo, standing right here, looking this way. And so you can see there what it looked like before we started planting the rain and the native food bearing vegetation. So we then started planting the rain, working here where there was this existing dip in the curb because there had once been a driveway here. Mm. So we noticed in the big rain events, water would come down and would pour down the driveway and into the carport and then out the back door and flood the neighbor. So we wanted to turn that liability into an asset. So what we did is we came over here and created a earthen berm armored with some rock uh, that goes all the way back here. So this whole thing fills with water. Wow. This is actually a rain gauge. We get 12 inch depth of water in a really good rain event right there but it drops down in elevation there, so we get two foot depth of water. All that water very rapidly infiltrates, so we don't contribute to mosquitoes. We actually contribute to less mosquitoes mm. because we have this amazing sponge-like soil that rapidly absorbs the water. So it all infiltrates in less than an hour. So there's no puddles for mosquitoes. We don't lose water to evaporation. And all this organic matter is just leaf drop from the plants we planted. We don't rake it up and get it out of here. And when we prune the adjoining vegetation, we cut it up and put it in here as well. So it's all free. So all up and down the street are the are curb cuts like this that you've been talking about. Yeah, so when we first started by using that existing dip in the curb where there had once been a driveway, that's where we started. You know, that was totally legal. We weren't changing hard infrastructure. But there's so many parts of the neighborhood that don't have the driveway dip access. So that's where we started cutting the curb and to create a water inlet point. So the water comes down the gutter, fills this whole basin up, freely irrigates all that vegetation. And once it's filled, it backs up on itself and the surplus goes to the next basin. So this is a little innovation that we created called a backwater or an eddy basin. No water flows through, it just flows in, it fills up and then backs up on itself. So there's not erosion issues. And then it helps to grow beautiful shade like this. Oh yeah. I mean, that tree is fueled by this water. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's also not only providing shade, uh, you know, for all of us, it's also cooling the temperature for it. So mm. the water loss to evaporation and evapotranspiration is less for the tree and the understory plants at the same time. Like all the benefits just keep building on each other. Yeah. We were like in the road basically here. This was a, a kind of a big cutout that's a, an air, a retention area. Um, tell me more about what we're standing in. Yeah, well, we were so successful working along the street, we decided, well, let's take it into the street because <laughs> we've got these excessively wide streets that are adding to the heat island effect. So we basically pulled the curb out to narrow the street, slow traffic, create more plantable space. Water comes from behind us, flows through, fills this up, and then the surplus spills out the other end. 
and it's the free irrigation of all this. And look at how much lower we are than the adjoining street. So it's got a huge capacity. Yeah, this big area is gonna hold a lot of water. I mean, you can tell right away. You're not gonna have tons of outflow, I don't, I don't think. It's, it's no. awesome. So this basin, it easily captures um, well over 10,000 gallons a year of storm water. Wow. And uh, so this, along with our street side efforts um, and other in-street efforts, we are, as a neighborhood, in the public right-of-way, in the public commons, we are harvesting over a million gallons of storm water per year that used to just flow out of the neighborhood. Well, Brad, you are a, a wealth of information about rainwater harvesting uh, and please let folks know like how they can learn more about this. Yeah, so I strongly recommend they check out the full color editions of my books, Rainwater Harvesting for Drylands and Beyond, which they can get at deep discount direct from me at my website, harvestingrainwater.com. And uh, in addition to that, which shows rainwater, graywater harvesting, stormwater harvesting, they can also check out our neighborhood efforts at neighborhoodforesters.org with all kinds of resources for other neighborhoods to do this, evolve it, expand it, and go for forward. Based on what I've seen here on your property and what I've seen around Tucson, I mean, you and this community are leaders in this effort. So I really encourage people to check out those resources. Thank you for this awesome tour. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. You're in the water loop. <laughs>